Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be joined by former Prime Minister Liz Truss. Liz, thank you very much for sacrificing the time to speak to me today, and as well, taking a chance on an outlet which isn't SW1 approved. That's I'm very grateful. That's for that. my favourite kind of media outlet. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I appreciate that you've said that you don't get invited to as many dinner parties anymore, and actually that it's kind of a I badge of honour. I didn't say anymore. I didn't think I was ever invited to them, to be honest. All right. Well, well, fair enough. I mean, I, I do, I do appreciate the sort of human hand grenade nature that you, I think you were disparagingly nicknamed, but given the sclerotic nature of Westminster, it comes in handy. Um, of course, the, the recent reason you've been speaking to folks like me and that is because you've got new book out, 10 Years to Save the West. Um, interesting insight into how Parliament actually works. So before we delve into its contents, I wanted to ask, as for the title, why 10 years? Save the West from what? And is the West still a cohesive entity? Because we were looking at a multipolar world. Um, is it going to stay together? When I'm talking about saving the West, what I'm talking about is the fact that currently our societies, our values, the very foundation of Western civilization is being undermined, whether that's the uh, gender ideology that is trying to lie fundamentally about biological sex, whether it's the degrowthers who don't believe in progress, who instead want to see our countries undermined and I'm not just talking about the UK I think this is true in the United States it's true in Canada it's true right across the western world or indeed it, things that we believe in like equal rights freedom democracy you know, we've got people on our university campuses on the streets of London campaigning in favor of terrorists who want to destroy those very ideas so that's what I'm talking about I'm talking about the west being destroyed from within. And of course, our enemies overseas want to take advantage of that. Now, why do I say 10 years? Well, it's because I've been in government for 10 years. So I know how long it takes to turn things around. I know you've got to win the argument. You've got to get into power. You've got to change the, the laws. And those things aren't quick and they aren't easy. But if we don't start very soon, I think the West is in serious trouble and probably the most important event this year is the US election. Now, I believe that if Joe Biden stays in the White House, that will seriously undermine the future of the West and could lead to our ultimate decline. Mm, I think many people, especially in our audience, will be agreeing with you there. One, one thing I want to pick up on is, of course, yeah, we need to get in power and change the laws. And you definitely did that. And you tried to do that. And then unceremoniously were deposed and blocked off at every turn. And you detail that pretty extensively in your book. So I wanted to say from the perspective of someone who's you know not off comm regulated, don't have to be super impartial, is a Tory member, out of the two in the running, I absolutely wanted you. And when suddenly the market seemed to move against you, I was scratching my head because I thought, well, the mini budget can't be causing this level of downturn. And I was pretty gutted that actually you, the most likely person to listen to dissidents, had her time in office cut short. You've, you've been insistent since then that since the Bank of England, the OBR and the like undercut your attempt to cut taxes and drive growth. So one, how do you feel since then? And two, what evidence do you have for the establishment moving against you in such a way? Well, as you rightly say, you know, the the measures that we announced in the mini budget, which even on the most pessimistic Treasury forecast, cost 45 billion over five years, are very, very small compared to the announcement of net zero by 2050, or even the furlough scheme. So we didn't see massive reaction to big public spending announcements. We did see a massive reaction to what was a programme of supply side reform and tax cuts that I believe over five years would have seen the economy growing and in fact more revenue coming into the exchequer. And the reason is we've got an economic establishment who don't support those policies. You know, we've got a Bank of England who don't believe in monetarism. They didn't have any accounting for the money supply in their model of inflation. That's why they got it so wrong. Uh, we've got a treasury and the OBR, by the way, is an offshoot of the treasury a sort of so-called independent offshoot of the Treasury and the Resolution Foundation. But those organisations believe in high taxes, high regulation, big government, close alignment with the EU, 
not upsetting China because they see China as a source of income. And they believe in high immigration as well to try and shore up, as they see it, the public finances. So you've got a whole group of people who have the same view of the British economy. They believe it's about managing decline. And those people did not want to be challenged. And what I was doing was challenging their very orthodoxy. And you know, look at how long they've been in charge. It was the Labour government in 1997 that made the Bank of England independent. I handed over entire control of monetary policy to the Bank of England. It was them who increased the power of the Treasury and the tre Treasury was already a powerful uh, organisation. And then it was George Osborne who created the Office of Budget Responsibility. But essentially, those decisions about what kind of economic policy do you believe in? Are you a supply side or are you a Keynesian? Are you a monetarist? They're no longer taken by politicians. They're taken by unelected officials. And Connor, you ask, what evidence do I have that they were deliberately undermining me? Well, the night before the mini budget, the Bank of England sold £40 billion of gilts. And then we had the LDI crisis, which emerged. Quasi and I were not told that there was a massive tinderbox waiting if interest rates went up and everybody knew interest rates were going to go up. The Bank of England then set a very short-term cliff edge for that issue to be resolved, thereby generating more uncertainty. And if you look at what the Bank of England is meant to do, they're meant to assure financial stability. And they didn't take action that would have done that. They didn't act in support of the government, which was their job. And then the Office of Respons Budget Responsibility effectively leaked a forecast that was wrong, but it forecast a whole of £70 billion. And that was put out deliberately to destabilise the government. I don't know who leaked it, whether it was the ABR or the Treasury, but clearly they were trying to demonstrate to the world that they didn't support my policies. You know, there was endless leaking and briefing, there was the weaponization of some of these issues by some Conservative MPs as well. So, you know, the, the policies were not given a fair wind or a fair hearing. Whereas, as I've said, you know, look at net zero or furlough. Those policies were welcomed with open arms and not questioned. So you've got to ask yourself the question, who is driving the policy and who is making the decision? It's interesting. So the 2021 Conservative Party conference, I was on a panel with the Adam Smith Institute because I did a in my in my old career, I, I did environmental policy stuff. And I was there with Chris Skidmore. And someone asked the question, Oh, when you sign net zero into law, was there a debate about it? Was there a cost of it? And he said, No, we just sort of changed the number. And I I, I genuinely asked him, you know, me being fresh faced and thinking everything's ticking along with higher level of expertise than me in my bedroom. I just went, What? You didn't you didn't cost it? And he looked at me like I just hit his dog with a car or something. You know, it was it was complete shock that this would be even questioned. So I, I do I do want to ask about the group think then, because and there was a report recently just, that just said on this net zero thing, I think it is very interesting because what happened was in 2008, the then Labour government put in place the Climate Change Act, which established the Climate Change Committee. And what Theresa May's action did was simply by secondary legislation changing the date. So the concept was all embedded under Blair, a bit like the concept of the way the Bank of England operates was embedded under Blair. Yeah, well, the embedding of the ECHR into British law is embedded under Blair. This is something that you've been saying since leaving government. So my, my question, I suppose, is, is twofold. Like, What pieces of Blair legislation do we actually need to jettison? And then as well, your book doesn't hold back on some of your colleagues reinforcing the status quo, you know, Rishi Sunak, Jeremy Hunt, Michael Gove, why do they want to keep in the legislation of the opposition party? I, I haven't understood why they haven't been quite as bold and forthcoming on you on upsetting the apple cart. Well, look what happened to me when I upset the apple cart. I think that's the fundamental reason that these things aren't challenged because there is a prevailing orthodoxy. It's very powerful. It's not just in the civil service and in the quangos like the Bank of England. It's also there in the corporate sector. You look at the whole Alison Rose debanking issue and the views 
there, look at the liberal media as well. You know, there is a group of people with a, a set of views and going against them is very, very painful and carries a very high price for politicians. And you can see that by politicians who do take a different line, just how much trouble they get. And it's a lot easier, frankly, to be praised by all the right thinking people and to go along with the status quo. You're likely to stay in your job longer and you are likely to you know, get invited to more dinner parties, as I said. And, and that social pressure, don't underestimate that, I think is absolutely huge on politicians who live and work in Westminster during the week, who are regularly talking to people of that ilk. And I find that I get a totally different response when I'm talking to my constituents in Norfolk to the, the people I end up talking to in Westminster. So I think that is the reason that you do get conservatives who go along with uh, the, 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 the status quo. But you're asking me which bit of Blair legislation would I repeal? It's easier to say which bits I wouldn't repeal because it is a huge list. But, you know, you've got to start with the Bank of England Act, the Climate Change Act, which you've just been talking about, the Human Rights Act, the Constitutional Reform Act is actually very important. That established the Supreme Court, which never existed in Britain. It never existed for a thousand years. It used to be the case the Lord Chancellor was the key judge. He was appointed by the Prime Minister. He would appoint senior judges. And you had a line into parliamentary sovereignty for the judiciary. We've now created this, or Blair created a Supreme Court. And those justices are appointed by a quango. So you've taken, you've, di you've diminished parliamentary sovereignty and you've created this new court, which is now challenging government decisions on a regular basis. Uh, the Equality Act, uh, the Gender Recognition Act. I mean, there is a whole litany of pieces of legislation that Labour First of all, they made bad policy decisions, but also what they did is they changed the architecture of government. So they embedded things like civil service practice. They created new quangos uh, and they have made it very, they've changed the balance of power so that ministers are now often held responsible for things they don't actually control and they're not actually able to change. That, that is the legacy of Blair. Yeah, I do. I do have to commend you, particularly on your work on the Gender Recognition Act and the like, because I'm friends with. I once even dated a, a woman who fell prey to gender ideology, and these really vulnerable, really wonderful people that have been led astray by a modern malady, and nobody else has been bold enough to put through a bill that says we need to ban social transition and and the infiltration of of locker rooms and, and women's sports by men with untoward intentions, and yet the Labour Party thought that. The naming of ferrets was more important to debate instead. I mean, mockery of democracy, I suppose. But the, the other, the other, the other thing on that as well is like, I remember going to Conservative Party com conference when when you were Prime Minister, it was twenty twenty two in Birmingham, and I still have the little booklet, you know, very commemorative. And I saw in there that the Tony Blair Institute has events at the conference, and like uh, uh, people were saying that oh, he was swanning around the Foreign Office at some point a couple of years ago, trying to give, I think it might have been your team, your predecessor's team, unsolicited advice. I don't get why a man with such a terrible record is given the time of day. Well, the Tony Blair Institute is a very, I think it you know, has a, a revenue of over £100 million a year. And he is going around talking to governments around the world. Like, I am completely in favour of open debate. I'm very happy to debate Tony Blair or anything else, or anybody else for that matter. But... There are too many people in the Conservative Party who say who say Blair is the master and we should admire Blair and we want to be the heir to Blair. And that was, I think, at the root of why we didn't go into government in 2010 with enough of a clear agenda to reverse some of those very damaging laws that Blair had put into place. And frankly, by the time I became Prime Minister in 2022, it was too late to do a lot of that big primary legislation change, what I thought the best I could do was dealing with the egregious tax and regulatory issues, getting on with things like fracking, getting the economy growing, not sticking up taxes 
so that we would be in a better position to win the election and come 2024, actually be able to do some of that heavy lifting that is so needed in Britain. I think people are beginning to recognise now just how broken the British state is and how broken governance is and how things don't work. But they don't work because that core accountability, the concept of parliamentary sovereignty, which is at the heart of the British constitution, has been lost. That's, that's the issue. Thank you for watching that clip from Tomlinson Talks. If you liked that and you would like to see more, you can get the full 90-minute show every week on a Wednesday afternoon, live from 3 p.m., only on lotuseaters.com and all of the other content that my colleagues produce behind the paywall for as little as £5 a month. Thank you very much for supporting us, and I hope to see you there. Until next time, goodbye.